These are the days of Elijah Declaring the word of the Lord And these are the days of your servant Moses Righteousness being restored And though these are days of great trials
this with me. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop. You never stop, Lord. You're faithful, Jesus. You never stop working. today in this place. We thank you because you truly are our way maker. Father, without you there's no hope. Without you there's no chance of salvation. Without you doing what you've done, we cannot come into church today and share the good news. But Father, because you are a way maker, you went to the cross and died, and rose again in three days. So we could call upon your name so we could ask for healings so we could ask for salvation so we could ask for help in our finances help in our marriage help in our family because of you Father that is who you are Father you never turn us down you never push us away you accept us with open arms and we thank you so much for that Father, I feel your presence in this place this morning. Father, I pray that you anoint my lips, hide me behind the cross as I bring your word today. But Father, first and foremost, if there's one here today who's not ready to receive the word that you have for this place here today, I pray that you remove whatever is trying to hinder them, soften their heart, and let them receive the word of God this morning. Father, oftentimes we come into church wondering what can we get from you. And Father, that's okay because that's who you are. But for the last weeks, we've come into church hearing a word about what we can do for you. Father, today that word is no different. I ask you open our hearts. And give them a will to do what you have called them to do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Today in this place, I should have just titled a series, I guess, for the last few weeks. Because it seems like everything I've preached on has not been about what God can do for you. But what you can do for God. And the story is no different today. The word of God is no different today. And it was confirmed last night about 11 o'clock sitting in my living room as God led me to a message that was preached at Redemption Church. I began to listen to what the man, what the guy was preaching and 
As I begin to listen to him, the Lord begin to confirm what he had for us today. And my question is, what are we designed to do? What is our purpose here and now? What are we called to do as a child of God? And I think too often as Christians, as children of God, we don't ask this question because it may require us having to sacrifice or it may require us having to give up something that we truly love doing. I think oftentimes the church don't ask people this question because we're afraid we may offend them. But you need to understand something. God says, I have a purpose and I have a plan. And I knew you before you was formed in your mother's womb. He also said, I've created you for such a time as this. It was not God's desire for you to sit down and quit once you retain salvation. That is not what the word of God tells us. But we have a purpose. Look around you today in this room and you see school teachers and you see nurses. And you see visiting nurses and you see principals. And you see different ones. You see loggers. And many, many other things. School bus drivers and the list just keeps going on and on. And that's what we have found ourselves doing for our career. And that's what the world has for us to do right now. But God has other plans for us sometimes. And sometimes what God has called us to do may not line up with what we're doing for the world. And that means that, of course, we have to let go of worldly things and get back to godly things. You see, as a child of God, we come in often every Sunday and we speak of God being the center of our universe. But when you tell a man or woman, a child of God, that God has called them to do something, and it means that they're going to have to give up something else. It's real quick to put God back down on the bottom of the list. It's real quick to shuffle God back down the line. If I come in here this morning and said I feel like God is wanting us to take up a certain offering, and God even called some of you to do it, we would reject him. We would say, no, I can't do that because I have bills to pay. But what you need to understand is if God calls you to do it, if God calls you to do it, he will make a way. He will make a way when there seems to be no way. But what has God called you to do? What has God? Have you asked him lightly, God, what have you called me to do? Have you truly prayed and sat down with God and begin to talk to God and truly ask God, God, what is your will for my life? Because you see, the reality is God has a will for each one of us. He has a plan for each of our life. Your plan may not look the same as mine. My plan may not look the same as someone else's, but God has a certain purpose and a certain plan for each one of us. Matter of fact, in Romans 10 and 17 it says, So then by faith comes, so then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Whatever you do is going to have to be done out of faith in God. You're going to have to exercise your faith to do what God has called you to do. And that means, you know, the, not a few weeks ago, we talked about stretching our faith. Some of us is going to have to stretch our faith like we've never stretched it before to be able to complete what God has called us to do. You can have all the accomplishments this world has to offer. You can be successful in this world. You can be the greatest person in the world. You can be a poster boy for Christ. But if you haven't done what God has called you to do, then you are still being disobedient to Christ. Do you understand what I'm telling you? Look, you can come in and you can pray over people. You can go home and pray and, and seek God's word. But if you refuse to do what God has called you to do, you are being disobedient to Christ. If you refuse to commit yourself to God and say, God, I sell out for you, then you are being disobedient to Christ. And I already see this ain't a word a lot of people's going to like today, but that's okay. I'm going to give you what God told me to give you today because you need to realize something. What God asked us to do with our life he already has a plan and a purpose for it he has a reason behind it and church today you need to realize something you are called to share god's world to love to the world you are called to tell the world about god and what he done for you and who he is and we are called to tell him that he is a way maker Amen. it's time church but not only does he say that i call you to do all that he even explains it in Matthew 5 and 13. He says, you are the salt of the earth. 
But what good is salt if it has no flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled. Now why would the Lord call us the salt of the earth? Because in our day and time, salt is nothing. You know, we pour it out on our meat. We pour it out on our... I mean, we use it for everything. We use it for seasoning. Uh, there's a salt shaker in every household. There's a salt shaker sitting on the table full of salt. But so why did God say that you're the salt of the earth? So I begin to study on this a little bit. God, why have you called us to be the salt of the earth? Of all the descriptions you can use, why did you use salt? And I want to explain it to you a little bit. Because you need to realize something. When you taste salt, it has a very unique taste. You're not going to grab a bottle of salt and dump it on your fries and say, that tastes like pepper. It ain't going to be like when we tell young kids, you know, they'll say, well, what squirrel tastes like? And everybody will say chicken. I mean, how many of you ever heard that? You'll say, what's deer tastes like? Oh, ground beef. You know, we do that. And, and a lot of times, now we've had people come to our house and say, I don't eat deer. And they'd say, that's the best chill in the world. And the whole time I'm thinking, well, there's some good deer meat there. <laughs> but they'll swear them down, they don't eat it because they don't know the difference in it. But church, there's a difference in salt. When you put salt in it, they know when it's been salted, Pastor Dan. And you can put too much salt. Salt has a unique flavor. It's different. It stands alone. Nothing can compare to it. And I want you to think about something today because that being unique, we use salt regularly. And it's hard to believe in the ancient world it was so precious that the Roman soldiers was actually paid with salt. Church, it was such a big deal back then. And it was so important that salt was used for preserving meats. It was used for medical purposes. It was used for seasoning food. And it was even used as a sign of friendship. You see, Days when we think of salt, we go grab a box of Morton's and we don't look at it and worry about it. We just go home and use it. But in that day and time, in biblical days and time, salt was something big. It was important. And I want to tell you today, the reason God calls you the salt of the earth is because you are important to him. But not only that, you know, I talked about salt having a unique taste, and you need to realize something today. As a child of God, we need to be uncomparable to the rest of the world. We need to be the salt of the world. We need to be unique. We need to have a different outlook about us. We need to have a different way we carry ourselves. We need to have, be able to tell. People need to walk in there and not have to say, well, is this pepper or what is this? They need to know, hey, that's the salt of the earth. That is one of God children. If you go to him, he's going to tell you about the love of Christ. He's going to be willing to pray for you no matter what you're going through. That's what God has called us to be. When God says you need to pour out your salt before it loses its flavor. In church, when we ask ourselves, what has God called us to do? We need to realize as children of God we are precious to him. Each and every one of you that has accepted Christ as your Savior is precious to him. We're different. We're supposed to be set apart. And it's our job to tell the world about the love of Christ. I want you to think about something in this room today. Somewhere in your life, somebody told you about Christ. Some point in time in your life, now whether you accepted him or not yet, somewhere at some point in time, somebody told you about a man named Jesus Christ. For if not, you would not be here today. Somewhere, somehow, somebody poured out a little salt on you. But church, what good is salt if we buy it and sit it beside the meat? What good is it? Because if we just sit it down on the table and never pour it out, then it's worthless. Do you hear me today? You can have salt all over your house, but if you never pick that box up and season anything, it is of no value to you. And that's the way we are to God. It is our job to allow God to pour us out. It is our God's job to allow God to pour us out amongst the sinners. But you know what the problem has got with the church today? We'll come in this building. We'll sit amongst the believers. And we'll tell every one of them how great our God is. And we'll tell them how much we love God. And we'll worship God with them. And we'll praise God. And we'll seek God. But you know where the church fails? 
It's when we open the door and go outside the door. We forget how to do that outside of here. God has called us for this time, for such a time as now. And he has called us to share his love to the world. And the sad thing is, and I hate to say this, so-called Christians that really haven't given their life to Christ, the ones that cause us to get called hypocrites, will share the word of God out in the world before a true follower of Christ will share it. Why is that, Chuck? Let me tell you why. Because the devil has put fear in you. The devil has made you feel unworthy. The devil has made you feel ashamed of who you were. But God says, don't hurt, worry about who you used to be. Worry about who you are with me and let me carry you. You see, we are called to do something for God. Each and every one of us in here. I want to ask you something. When is the last time you shared the love of God with a sinner? When is the last time you told somebody at your job about the love of Christ? When is the last time when you were sitting with those lost family members that you began to share the love of Christ with them and what God done for you? You say, well, Pastor God really ain't done a whole lot for me lately. He woke you up this morning. He done all he needed to do. Amen. Church, we're going to preach a funeral today. And that man, and a lot of you knew Ken, there was one thing he would tell me, and I know he's told Pastor Danny many times. He lived with a little bit of regret. And he would always say, Brad, I wish I'd have gave my life to God before all this. I wish I wouldn't have had to walk through all this to realize that I needed God. And I would always look to him and say, Ken, it's not about what you used to do but it's about the impact your life is going to make now. Church, I'm tired of letting the devil hold us back. I'm tired of being held back by him because we've got so fearful and we've got so caught up in self that we can't share the love of God. We are called to share God's love. One of the most important things that we can do is share the good news of the cross. But you know when we get caught up? We get caught up with, uh, you know, I don't want to make God look bad because... Look at what I used to be. God's not worried about that. You can't make God look bad unless you try to. If you're doing it out of love, it's not going to face God. If you can go to the world and say, look what God did for me, people's going to look at that, especially those that knew you before Christ. It's our job to share the love of Christ with the world. But we'd rather let everyone else do it. Well, I'm not called to do that. Yes, you are. The Bible says we are each called to show God's love. We are each called to tell the world about the good news of Christ. Well, I, I just don't feel appropriate doing it. Well, you better learn to feel appropriate. Because when you're getting to heaven, it, you're not going to be judged on what all you did do. But you're going to be judged on what you didn't do for Christ when he told you to do it. Church, I need you to understand something today. If a seasoning has no flavor, it has no value. If you bought salt and it was absolutely flavorless, then it's going to be rendered useless. And when we're not willing to pour our salt out on the world, we are rendered useless to God. And I know this ain't a shouting message, and this is more of just one of those sinking messages. I want you to understand something today. In Matthew 5 and 14, it says, You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp, then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise you. Now, I want to change translations, and Michael, you don't have this, so I didn't worry about giving it to you. But this is what the Passion Translation says. Your lives light up the world. For how can you hide a city that stands on top of the hill? And who would light a lamp then hide it under an obscure place? Instead, it's a place where everyone in the house can benefit from its light. Don't hide your light. Let it shine brightly through others so that your commendable works 
will shine its light upon them and they will give their praise to the Heavenly Father. Church, why would you go and turn on the light? You're just going to throw something over it, Pastor Danny, and not let it light the room. Do you realize the Father says, I am the light of the world? And the day that you give your life to the Father, he lights your pilot light. He lights it. And he says, now go and shine to the rest of the world. And the Bible right here tells us that we're like a city on the hilltop. And the other day when we went to Chattanooga, you could look out through the motel room and we were showing River how that, the house is up on that mountain. You could tell where each and every one of them was by just that little glimmer of light. Because you need to realize something. It don't take a big light to light up something. Light conquers darkness. And God says that is what we are to do. It doesn't matter how big your light is. You're supposed to shine your light for God. Today we want to get our light and we want to hide it and keep it hid from the world. And God says, what good is that? You see, I'm not going to go to my house tonight and turn on the lamp in the living room just to simply cover it up. But I'm going to go turn on that light because I need it to lead and guide me through that room. I need that light so I can get through the darkness without running into obstacles. And the world needs the light of God to shine again. Because we're running into obstacles. And the reason the world's gone to hell in a handbasket is because the light of Christ is not shining through anymore. The child that calls their self God is no longer sharing to the world. We have one of the greatest things ever to share the word of God. We have it easier than anybody's ever had it to share God's love. But you know what we'd rather do? We'd rather post our family drama. We'd rather post the negative things of the world. We'd rather post a bunch of trash when in all reality, why not use your Facebook to post about the love of Christ? Church, I'm telling you, it's time for us to light up the world again. It's time for us to do what God has called us to do. Those who have truly not accepted in Christ, for some reason, seem to let their light shine brighter than we do. That's sad, you know, that they're willing to say, hey, I'm a child of God, and then we'll stand over there and hide. And you say, well, pastor, are you judging them? No, I'm not judging them. But I'm going to tell you now, and I even talked to a Baptist minister about this the other day. And me and him and Pastor Danny was talking, and we was talking about how so many people say they're saved, but there's no transformation. Church, there's no salvation without transformation. Do you hear me today? When God lights that light in your life, something in your life is going to change. And if it hasn't changed, then you probably have not truly given your heart to God. And and you're going to have a will to serve God. You're going to have a will to work for God. You're going to have a will to know God. And you're going to want to hear his voice. But the problem today is we give our life to Christ and we think that's all there is to it. No, the Bible says you've got to keep going. You know you'll never find the word retirement in the Bible nowhere. Go look and see. Go look and see if you can find that you retire from what God has called you to do. Now, you might can step out of certain positions, but God still calls you to speak of his word. Church, you've got to realize something. It's time for us to light up the world. But we don't have to be perfect to do it. I want you to think about David. The Bible tells us he was a man after God's own heart. David wasn't perfect. The first time Samuel who anointed him as a backslidden king saw Susera, and he said, your kingdom shall not come. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart. Samuel had backslid. And God said, I'm going to put David in his place. And do you realize that when God put David in that place, he knew the mistakes David was going to make? He knew the mistakes David was going to make. But he said, you know what? Even now, I'm going to put a man that's after my own heart. We as a world haven't seen his kingship, but God already knew the future. But he said, this is going to be a man after my own heart. And then the second time it was stated was when Paul, who recounted Israel, says, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. Who will do my will? Look here, church. You don't have to be perfect to do God's will. 
perfection was only for Christ. David was by no means perfect. He committed adultery. He committed murder. He separated himself from God. And in, in all reality, the way his resume looked, you would think, how in the world does the Lord say that this is a man after God's own heart? How can we honestly say that? Because he was hungry for God. Church, he sought after God. He had a passion for spiritual things. He tried to please God despite his failures. He said, Lord, I know I messed up today, but I'm going to start over again tomorrow. And that's the way a child of God should be. Lord, I know I didn't do it right today. I didn't set the example that you have called me to set today. But tomorrow, I'm going to go back out in the world, and I'm going to try to lead people to Christ again by the way I carry myself. But we don't want to do what God calls us to do. Because that means we've got to give up some of our sinful ways. But David, even though he messed up, always come back and repent. And church, that's all you've got to do when you mess up. Just come back and give yourself back to God and say, God, I know I blowed it today. I know I sinned, and I know I messed up, and I need forgiveness, and I need a new start. And you know what the Word of God tells us? He'll give us a fresh start. David was a man after God's heart. And notice how God let him eat showbread reserved only for priests and wear ephod. When he danced before the ark, usually God kept the kingship of priesthood strictly separate. He kept kingdomship and priesthood strictly separate because all the kings of Israel was normally corrupt. But for some reason, David was both. And the reason being is because he was truly a man after God's own heart. In Psalm 6 through 3 and 8, he says, My soul follows hard after you. Church, I want you to understand we got to begin to be God chasers. We got to begin to get in our mind that I'm going to do whatever you have called me to do, God. But in order to be able to do what God's called you to do, you're going to first have to start asking him, God, what is your will for my life? Several times before I became a pastor, I began to pray, God, what, what's going on and what you want us to do? Now, Candace would always say, I already told you what God wants you to do. But even before, and y'all heard the story many times, even before we went forward, I would pray, God, what is your will in my life? What do you want me to do for you? Because I don't realize something. I've done a lot from the devil. I've done a lot to tear the kingdom of God up. And where I could have been leading people to Christ, I was leading people to hell. But church, there was a transformation that happened during salvation that changed my way of thinking. And if you truly got salvation, your way of thinking ought to be a lot different now. It, not, it ought not always be, well, I'm going to go to church Sunday and I'm going to see what God's going to do for me. Your way of thinking is going to be, I'm going to go to church Sunday and see what I can do for God. Because you see, the way we praise God and the way we worship God shows that we're committed to God. And the way to be committed to God is to give him everything you have. Sometimes that means you're going to have to give up things of this world. I want you to stand with me this morning. God, what have you called us to do? Will you be willing to ask him that this morning? What have you called me to do? But now listen to me. Some of you say, well, Pastor, I've never heard the voice of God. You've probably heard it, just didn't realize what it was, if you prayed to him enough. But in order to truly hear God, you've got to first say, God, let me recognize your voice. Let me know that it's your voice and not grandma and granddaddy's, not mom and daddy's, not the pastor's. Let me know that it's calling, that you're the one calling me to do this. Look, this is going to make some people upset, but there's a lot of pastors that get behind the pulpit that was called by everybody but God. And there's a lot of teachers that's called by everybody but God. But this is what I ask you this morning. And I don't normally tell you what to pray at dollar, but this is simply what I feel like the Lord has told me to do this morning. 
I want you to say, God, if you don't know his voice, I want you to ask him. Let me first know that it's your voice. Then open my ears to hear what you're about to tell me. If you're willing to pray this prayer, this is what I want you to ask me. Tell me what your call for me is. Tell me what more I can do for you. Maybe, maybe you're already living out your call, but there's more God wants. Maybe as a family, you need to join hand and say, God, what is your call for our family? Listen to me, husband. It's time for the men to step up. We weak. You, you don't like to hear that because we're supposed to be strong. Well, I can pick up more than my wife. Yeah, but can you pray like your wife? Can you talk to God the way your wife talks? Come on now, we'll say I'm the head of the household, but are you the head of the household? Are you willing to pick up your word of God when your wife and your family's down and begin to seek God's face and begin to turn to God for things? Are you willing to let your young children see you humble down before God and say, God, what have you called our family to do? Because if you're standing in this place today, you're supposed to be the Christian. Listen to me. The Christian head of the household. You're supposed to be the spiritual leader for your family. That don't mean that you get to step all over your wife. That don't mean that you get to treat her ugly. But when it all comes down, to tying the knot at the end of the rope, you're supposed to be the one that makes the call. So I want to ask you this morning, are you willing to say, God, what are you calling me to do? Will you tell me this morning? And maybe God don't tell you right now. Maybe it's not. Maybe the time is not right. Maybe you're not ready to hear what God's going to tell you. And, and when you leave here, you're going to feel like, well, Lord, I believe you spoke to some, but you never told me. Don't quit praying. Listen to me. Don't quit praying because there may be something that you got to do before God can tell you. So what you need to do is begin to say, God, what have you called me to do? And what do I need to do to hear that calling? So I'm going to ask you, if you want to come around the altar, you can. And I'm going to tell you, I'm not going to come around and pray over each one of you. I'm going to stand up here and pray with you. Because as your pastor, I need to make sure I'm doing what God's called me to do. So I'll lead the pack. I'll be the first one at the altar. Will you ask him today, Lord, what have you called me for? The altars are open. Father, today, I believe in this place I have heard your call. But God, is there more that you want out of me? Is there more you need me to do as the pastor of this church, as the leader of this flock? What have you called us to do? God, are we carrying out your vision the way you want us to carry it out? Father, for each and every family that stands down around this altar, I pray that they hear your voice. They'll listen to it, and they'll open up their heart to truly accept the call that you have put on their life. Father, for some, this may come with sacrifice. It may be hard. Father, for some, it may be like me. The numbers on the paper don't add up. But God, give them strength to know that where it's your will, you will provide a way. You will pave the path for us. And all we have to do is walk on it. Father, for each and every person that's here today, I pray they begin to seek out their calling. Father, we know you have called us to tell people about the good news of Christ. You have called us to tell people about the love of Christ. But for some, there's a certain calling that you have placed on our life. Let us open our hearts to receive that calling today. Father, for me, let me be open to whatever you call me to do. Lord, if I messed it up, I'm sorry. Please forgive me and let me get back on the right path. 
Give me a spiritual hunger and a desire to serve you and do your will in my life like never before. God, I ask that you touch my wife and my children. And I ask that you touch each and every member of this church in a mighty way. Give us strength to live out what you have called us to do. Only through you can we succeed today. Let us trust in you like we never have before. Even when I don't see it. Even when we don't see it, Father, you're working. Even when, I don't Even when we don't feel it, you're working. Because you're way maker, God. You never stop working. You never stop working, Father. You never stop. Lord, please you never, never give up on me. Because I know I mess up at times. See it, you're working. Even when I give us strength in this place today. You never stop. He's our way maker, church. Miss Brandy, I want you, if you can, I know you got another service to sing. And I want you to sing that one time before Pastor Danny comes. Because we need to realize when we feel inadequate, when we feel less than, when we feel unworthy, it's his job to make the way. It's his job to paint a path. You're looking at a walking miracle. And you say, well, Pastor, you've never been healed. You don't know what I was if you don't think I've ever been healed. I didn't have a sickness that was physical. Pastor, I didn't have that kind of sickness. I had a sin sickness. And a miracle worker come into my life. And he set me up on a potter's wheel. And I imagine there were several times, Pastor Danny, that he had to start over. He had to remold me because I flawed. I messed up. But he is a way maker. If you'll trust in him, seek him for what he has called you to do. And when he tells you, don't look for your spouse. Don't look at your pastor to help you do it. I'll help you as much as I can. But look to the cross because he's the one that's going to make a way when there seems to be no way. Miracle worker, 
promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Waymaker, waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here. Touching every heart, I worship you. I worship you, Lord. You are here, healing every heart. I worship you. don't see it you're working even when I don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when I don't see it you're working even when I don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when I don't see it, you're working. 